Yeah, thanks, Brian. Uh, yeah, speaking of uh, Colonel Wilkerson, you just mentioned how our government works, uh, and, and you having uh, an inside view to that. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to ask this question, but I, I guess the question is just, uh, while you were Colin Powell's chief of staff, and while the administration was uh, pushing for a war in Iraq and uh, hawkish foreign policies and uh, neoconservative foreign policies, uh, I guess, could you just speak to a little bit about what was that whole experience like for you, from your perspective, uh, when they were talking about things like weapons of mass destruction? I mean, you must have understood that uh, Saddam Hussein was not a threat to the safety of people in America. So I, I don't know, could you just speak a little bit about uh, your experiences from that time? It was the worst time in my life. Uh, certainly the worst time in my professional life as a military officer or member of the United States government or whatever. Um, and it ruined the relationship between me and Colin Powell. By the time January 2005 came around, we weren't even speaking to each other. Uh, he'd go one way down the aisle and I'd go the other way down the aisle. If he had something he wanted to tell me, he'd send it through Marjorie's executive assistant. Or if I had something to tell him, I'd make sure my deputy, Peggy Safrino, chief of staff, gave it to him. Um, when he gave me an award at the end, you see a picture right back here on the wall of him giving me an award, the highest award the Secretary of State can give anyone. Um, I walked out, put it in a drawer and didn't look at it again. Uh, my wife told me, put the picture up. <laughs> um, I really felt low. I felt as low as I'd ever felt in my life. And it wasn't just the Iraq war. It was having served, having served an administration that would torture people those instructions for torture would come from the president of the United States. I was not naive. I knew the United States military had tortured thousands in the Philippines. I knew that we had, at the turn of the last century, I knew we had tortured people in Vietnam, but this was military gone awry and there were courts and courts martial and we did something about it. Never in our history has the president of the United States ordered other people in the world to be tortured. That happened in my administration. When I think about that, I still get angry. I still get angry at myself for not walking out the door. Of course, I didn't know it until I got to the end of 2004 uh, when Powell had charged me after the Abu Ghraib photographs came out with finding out for him how we got there. And I didn't find out, I didn't complete my investigation until late in 2004. That's one of the reasons uh, we weren't talking because I thought I knew the truth. I have subsequently, because of good students on two campuses, George Washington University and William and Mary, discovered even more. And I'm debating right now whether or not I publish this some thousand page manuscript I've created because it will really, really hurt a lot of people. Uh, I don't know whether I'm going to or not. I may go to my grave without having published it. Um, it was a terrible time. I saw more than I saw in Vietnam as a soldier engaged in killing people for the state, more than I saw in any of my military education, more than I'd seen anywhere else serving Admiral Bill Crow out in the Pacific, who later became chairman of the Joint Chiefs Staff and uh, was a brilliant man. Um, operating at the highest levels of decision-making in the U.S. government. I didn't see the rough side of empire, if you will, until George W. Bush and Dick Cheney came along. Um, and it was all Colin Powell could do to deal with it. It was, it, it was innervating. It was soul sapping. It was deadly. And you didn't know whether you were going to stick around. I wrote out my resignation several times and had long conversations with my wife. Um, and she said, if you leave, you'll have no one there to protect you. Uh, you need to stay and so forth. And uh, at the end of the day, she probably was right because it would have been, un it would have been not just disloyal, it would have been really, really selfish of me to think of my own reputation and my own conscience and so forth when I saw him racked almost every day. 
whether it was North Korea or it was Iran or it was China or it was Taiwan or you name your issue. He was up against the vice president, the president and the national security advisor almost opposed completely on each of them. The only one he won on consistently was China. And that was to the credit of, or, or to the benefit of the United States to be sure. But he won on that because George W. Bush knew the benefit of China to Walmart. He knew that without the Chinese producing, producing um, Walmart wouldn't exist, nor would half of the rest of American enterprise. So he knew that was important and he backed Powell on that relationship, but almost, and he backed him on HIV AIDS, which is why President Bush is revered in Africa, even today. Um, so there were some positive things, but most of it was a, just a, a almost existential fight every day. And that is really taxing. And then when you realize things like I just admitted, torture, that the president ordered the torture, and that we did the things we did with regard to the Middle East. I mean, just look at it from a rational point of view. We empowered Iran. We destroyed two, three, four countries. Obama came along and made it another one with Libya. And by the way, in that meeting in the White House in 2015, he literally apologized for Libya in front of John Kerry. He said his first words out of his mouth were, there's a bias in this town toward war. Let me say that again. There's a bias in this town toward war. I didn't think I'd ever hear a sitting president say that. Um, and then he talked about how really he didn't know what to do about it. That's what every president faces. That's what every president will face more and more. Uh, we have to change that. We have to change that. So. I've rambled a little bit. I uh, rambled a lot, but it was a bad time. It was a tragic time for my country, for my beloved boss, and for the State Department. It was a tragic time. Well, thank you for that answer. Um, uh, my follow-up here is uh, for a group like Massachusetts Peace Action, which is uh, limited in our resources, uh, what do you think, what can we do to uh, um, stop the destructive policies of the U.S. empire? Where are the pressure points in the U.S. empire that a group like Mass Peace Action can have an impact? I get that question a lot, and I usually say <clears throat> something like this. I was, for a time there, I was called the Quaker Colonel <laughs> because I was spending so much time with FCNL, the French Committee for National Legislation, because they're one of the most powerful lobby groups I've ever encountered. And I put myself in with them every time I could for a long time, about a five-year period. The most powerful thing they did was constituent visits. And they did it this way. They called every state in the union and they got a delegation. It might be 10, it might be 20, it might be 40 for some of the bigger states and some of the states that could afford to do what they were doing, send their people to Washington. Then they had a huge conference and they war gamed it. They got everybody on the same shoot of music with regard to the war power, with regard to spending, with regard to uh, what was the other really big, uh, well, the big issue became the Yemen war. And they said, go ye out to the Congress. You cannot refuse if you're a senator or a representative a constituent visit. If you're from Wisconsin, you better take that party from Wisconsin or you're gonna pay for it. And they also had a way to make them pay for it if someone did have the gall to turn a visit down. Um, sometimes they'd postpone and the party would have to stay around longer and spend more money on hotels and so forth. But I never saw anything as powerful as that. Going into the congressman, the senator's office and telling them what you wanted, giving it to them in no uncertain terms, whether it's restoring constitutional war power or it's stopping US support. We got the vote in both houses for stopping US support for the war in Yemen. Trump vetoed it. Senate passed it, House passed it, but Trump vetoed it. And frankly, there were not enough courageous congressmen to override that veto. Most of them wanted to, 
even the hardcore Republicans that we had the most difficulty with, and even people like Steny Hoyer and Nancy Pelosi, they were against it too. They didn't want it to happen. Oh, they prated about how they were against it. But when it came time to do it, when it came time to cast your vote, ooh, ooh, they didn't vote for it because they're in the complex too. Both sides are in the complex and they're in the Saudi, the, the, the sort of Saudi grip too. But we did get the vote. And, and if Trump hadn't been the president, I think we would have got it. And that would have started the unwinding of all the authorizations for the use of military force. The one post 9-11 is still in effect. We're fighting a war all across the, the world, 29 countries, you know, under that authorization for the use of military force. That's nonsense. Congress needs to revoke that. Um, yeah, so that's I, the most powerful way. Telephone calls are good. Letters and emails are good. But boy, that constituent visit is really powerful. 